Thursday, July 7, 2016. Chaos erupts in the heart of Dallas as hundreds of civilians protesting in the streets run for their lives as a lone gunman takes an elevated position and opens fire on dozens upon dozens of Dallas police officers in a historic ambush on American law enforcement. And after four and a half hours and hundreds of rounds exchanged with police, the incident would come to an end with the detonation of C4. On July 5th of 2016, following the fatal police shooting of Alton Sterling of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, protests erupted in the city as videos of the incident spread throughout social media like wildfire. And while the protests were peaceful, what would follow was anything but. As on the following day, on July 6th, 37-year-old Philando Castile of Minnesota was fatally shot by police following a traffic stop. And the incident was live streamed to Facebook by Castile's girlfriend, creating the flashpoint of nationwide protests as thousands of protesters took to the streets, beginning in Charlotte, Falcon Heights, Minnesota, and Philadelphia. And with a 24-hour media frenzy, thousands more viewing at home were emboldened to take to the streets. And by July 7th, over 14 cities were consumed by unrest from Atlanta, Baton Rouge, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Greensboro, Jersey City, Kingston, Oklahoma, Portland, and Seattle leading to thousands of arrests nationwide. And soon enough, clashes with law enforcement, mass looting, and full-blown lawlessness would erupt across the nation, as thousands of bad actors would take advantage of the chaos. But few were as emboldened as 25-year-old Texan native, Micah Xavier Johnson. Johnson had been premeditating an attack on law enforcement for several years and trained regularly for just the occasion. Johnson, an Army veteran, enlisted out of high school as a carpentry and masonry specialist, but he would later go active duty and deploy to Afghanistan in 2013. But by 2014, Johnson's troubles would begin. In May of 2014, while deployed, a female soldier accused Johnson of harassment and sought a protective order, citing his need for mental health counseling. She recounted a specific incident where in a fit of rage over her departure for college, Johnson shattered a car window with his fist, injuring himself severely. He then forced her to take him to the hospital. Additionally, he sent her barrages of Facebook messages, which I won't repeat, but take my word for it. Another soldier stated Johnson had anger management issues and would repeatedly watch 1991 LAPD videotapes where he'd make odd and concerning statements. Following an internal investigation into Johnson's unusual behavior, Johnson was disarmed following his platoon sergeant's recommendation, who believed him to not only be a danger to himself, but genuinely a potential threat. Subsequently, Johnson was subject to a major investigation by the Army. But before we get into the details, a quick word from today's sponsor, Aura. Despite its promises, artificial intelligence has quickly become a massive threat to our finances and our identities as AI voice scammers only need three seconds to clone you or your loved one's voice and use it to access your accounts or deceive your loved ones. Aura protects you from not only scam callers, but robocallers spamming your phone by tackling the issue at its roots, by identifying data brokers, collecting and selling your information, and removing it from their list. These data brokers are legally required to do so Granted, there's an issued request. Aura does it for you. By automatically opting out of data broker lists, Aura has significantly reduced the number of robocalls that I receive, giving me a peace of mind and helping secure my information. But that's not all they do. Aura provides comprehensive protection that includes antivirus software, a VPN for secure browsing, secure password management, identity theft insurance, and even credit monitoring all in one single app. You no longer need to manage multiple subscriptions to multiple apps on your phone. Aura consolidates everything you need into one convenient platform, saving you time, money, and storage. If you'd like to stick it to robocallers and protect your information, I highly recommend checking out Aura. They're even offering you guys a two week free trial. Simply go to aura.com forward slash popomedic or click the link in the description and protect you and your family today. Johnson was placed under a 24 hour escort and relocated to Bagram Airfield 
on May 3rd. By May 14th, while army personnel cleared out Johnson's belongings in his living space, soldiers found prohibited explosives, grenades, a box of 50 cal, and another soldier's prescribed medication, all of which was hidden in his sleeping bag. You know, first carpentry. Consequently, the army immediately returned Johnson stateside. His military lawyer at the time noted that the army began to process Johnson for an other than honorable discharge. However, Johnson was honorably discharged in September of 2014 due to an administrative oversight by the army. And with an honorable discharge on his resume, ironically, Johnson expressed interest in a career in law enforcement. However, soon after his discharge, those close to Johnson reported that he became disillusioned, withdrawn, and harbored resentment towards the United States government, indicating that his military experience may have been a source of disappointment. This isolation only escalated, bringing Johnson down an even darker path as he became all consumed by his conspiracies and his plots of an attack on law enforcement. He began running drills and scenarios through his house and in 2014 underwent training at a private self-defense school as well as a firearms academy known for teaching advanced shooting tactics from aggressive run and gun to CQB. Around this time, Johnson began amassing his arsenal, collecting ammunition, flammable chemicals, electronic devices, and PVC piping necessary for building explosives. And with protests and riots over Sterling and Castile taking center stage on the news, one particular protest scheduled in Johnson's area of Dallas was set to take place at 7 p.m. And Johnson took it as his opportunity to strike. The protest began like clockwork right at 7 p.m and nearly 100 Dallas PD officers were assigned to see it through. Although hundreds of officers were present, a nameless member of the Dallas Police Department's brass ordered the officers assigned to the protest to not wear any military-style bulletproof vests, as they didn't want officers to look quote-unquote aggressive. Furthermore, officers were barred from bringing their patrol rifles, leaving them with nothing more than their 9mm pistols due to the ongoing criticism of the militarization of police, which would soon reveal itself to be a fatal mistake. As darkness descended at approximately 8.55 p.m., Johnson arrives on the corner of Elm and Lamar Street and then moved out on foot, heading south on Lamar Street towards Main Street, where officers blocking traffic had gathered donning Kevlar body armor with level three plates and armed with an AK-74 and Glock 19, Johnson approached the officers and opened fire. Officer Patrick Zamaripa raced toward the gunfire on foot and was tragically killed in the initial burst. The crack of gunfire echoed through the streets, reverberating off the of buildings, creating mass panic as hundreds of protesters ran for their lives as officers attempted to shield them from incoming fire. But this echo effect created confusion, disorienting law enforcement, leading them to believe there were two shooters. Senior Corporal Lorne Arns, a 14-year veteran of the Dallas Police Department, was fatally shot near El Centro College while trying to protect protesters. And three other Dallas police officers, Jorge Barrientos, Gretchen Rocha, and Senior Corporal Ivan Saldana, along with two civilians, were badly injured. And at exactly 9.01 p.m., down and disabled officers radioed for help. All squad elements, 801 Main Street. All squad elements, 801 Main Street. Breaking news, a fresh act of madness in America. At least two snipers opening fire in downtown Dallas during a rally against the fatal police shootings of black men in Louisiana and in Minnesota in recent days. The snipers hit 11 police officers, at least five of whom are now dead, making it the deadliest day in law enforcement since September 11th. Johnson fled into a nearby parking garage and utilized a tactical advantage from the second story where he opened fire on officers responding from the West End. Officer Michael Kroll was shot and killed while responding to the burst of gunfire. Officer Misty McBride was shot while taking cover, and Officer Lee Cannon and a Dallas police sergeant were also hit as Johnson indiscriminately shot at police. Officers still struggled to pinpoint his location as Johnson frequently moved positions and used the concealment of darkness and fleeing civilians to his advantage. 
allowing him to make his way to El Centro College. He shot out the glass doors, but Dallas police officers Brian Shaw and John Abbott were inside. All three men opened fire, and all three would catch a wound. But Johnson turned around and headed back down Lamar Street, where he hid behind concrete pillars before sneaking up on Officer Brent Thompson. Footage from a nearby rooftop captured Johnson rushing Thompson from behind and shooting him multiple times in the back, killing him. Johnson then breached El Centro College and stumbled his way up the second floor and entered the library, where he fired from the window overlooking Elm Street. Dallas Police Sergeant Michael Smith, who was taking cover on Elm Street, was fatally shot. Close by, Officer Jesus Rotana sustained a gunshot wound to the arm. But at this point, officers knew exactly where Johnson was. Oh, oh God, guys, slow down. He's in the damn building right there. Sergeant Larry Gordon rendezvoused with officers at the college and ascended the stairwell. Realizing the police were closing in, Johnson barricaded himself inside the library and had no other choice but to respond to Sergeant Gordon's negotiations from the hallway. Johnson made it clear that there was no chance or scenario of which he would surrender. And as the negotiations broke down, approximately 200 rounds were then exchanged in the hallway between police and Johnson. Neither took a casualty. Meanwhile, Chief Brown, already having deployed SWAT officers with a Remotech Andros Mark V robot, a robot used for bomb disposal, ordered his SWAT officers to equip the robot with C4 and detonate it at Johnson's location, something no police department had ever done before. And by 1.28 a.m., Chief Brown's historic decision detonated on the second floor, ending a four and a half hour ordeal in microseconds. Five officers were killed, nine were injured, as well as two civilians. The Dallas community and nation mourned the loss of the five officers with memorials and vigils held in Dallas and across the country. Tributes poured in from the world, acknowledging the bravery and service of the fallen officers. Dallas PD, along with local and federal agencies, conducted a thorough investigation into the attack. Recovered evidence from Johnson's home revealed he had enough explosive material to cause devastating effects throughout Dallas and the North Texas area, according to Chief Brown. Law enforcement agencies across the U.S. revisited their tactical preparedness, communication, and response strategies for dealing with ambush-style attacks. Michael Kroll answered that call. He came a thousand miles from his home state of Michigan to be a cop in Dallas. Last year, he brought his girlfriend back to Detroit for Thanksgiving. It was the last time he'd see his family. Michael Smith answered that call, a man of deep faith. When he was off duty, he could be found at church or playing softball with his two girls. Today, his girls have lost their day, but God has called Michael home. Patrick Zamaripa, he answered that call. Just 32, a former altar boy who served in the Navy and dreamed of being a cop. On Thursday night, while Patrick went to work, his partner, Christy, posted a photo of her and their daughter at a Texas Rangers game. Brent Thompson answered that call. He served his country as a Marine. And just about two weeks ago, he married a fellow officer. Lauren Aarons, he answered that call. And the night before he died, he bought dinner for a homeless man. And the next night, Katrina had to tell their children that their dad was gone. They don't get it yet, their grandma said. They don't know what to do quite yet. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video or even learned something, be sure to hit that subscribe button. There's a lot more documentaries in the works and you don't want to miss them. And if you want to be a part of the action, I'm currently looking for volunteers to take part in a dramatized reenactment of the Battle of Athens for an upcoming video, which I'll be directing in Athens, Tennessee. If you're interested and live within the area of Tennessee, please send me a DM on Instagram or contact 
popometicbusiness at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.